Hello, everyone. My name is Teresa Davidson, and I'm one of the National Engagement Directors of the American Liver Foundation. We are excited to be working with the Ohio Medical Advisory Committee members, Dr. Mealy Debroy, a pediatric transplant surgeon from the University Hospital, and Dr. Vera Hupetz, a director of Pediatric Liver and Transplant Center at Cleveland Clinic Children's on this great educational program and welcome you to the Ask the Experts Liver Transplant Education Program for Pediatrics. Um, the American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. Since seven, 1976, the ALF has promoted education, advocacy, support services, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. Education is a major part of our mission, and we thank you for coming today to learn more on liver disease. Liver donation is important to us. As we know, there are over 12,282 people waiting for a life-saving liver transplant. We've developed the Greatest Gift Living Donor Liver Transplant Information Center for more information on live liver transplant. Now I'm gonna turn over the, um, the program to Kat Evans, our National Engagement Coordinator. Hello everyone. I know many of you have been on Zoom calls before, but I wanted to quickly review a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This presentation will be recorded and it's gonna be housed on the ALF YouTube channel. The link to watch today's presentation will be sent to you in a follow-up email. To keep background noise to a minimum, we ask that you please mute yourself during the presentation. The microphone icon to mute can be found on the bottom toolbar. After each speaker has presented their topic, we will hold a Q&A session. At that time, please feel free to join us by turning your cameras on so we can see all of your lovely faces. During the Q&A session, feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question. If you prefer to just type in a question, please use the chat box option below. This icon is also found in your toolbar. We do welcome your participation and we'll do our best to address all of your questions. So please don't hesitate to ask. I'm now going to turn it back over to Teresa. We want to thank our sponsors for today's event, which include Meyer RX Specialty Pharmacy and Pharma. Without our sponsors, we would not be able to bring you educational programs and we truly appreciate their support. During the day today, we're gonna to give away several Zoomy giveaways. Um, we have lots of fun gifts to give and we will do our first drawing after we finish um, the spe speeches from everyone and, and do the Q&A. So stay tuned to make sure you, you're involved with the Zoomy giveaways. Now I'm gonna have Dr. Hooperts introduce our panel of expert. Great, thank you, Teresa. I'm Vera Huberts. I'm director of the Liver Center, Pediatric Liver Center at the Cleveland Clinic. And we are fortunate to have the following people that, with whom I worked very closely over the years at the Cleveland Clinic uh, to help understand more on improving our health and transplant experience. Many of you may know them or work with them already. And some of you may be new to the Cleveland Clinic transplant team, so I'd like to introduce them. First of all, there's Andrea also known as Andy Adler, who is an RD. She's a pediatric transplant dietitian, and she will be speaking on nutrition for biliary atresia. Next, we'll have Kevin Jacobson, uh, who's a licensed uh, social worker in transplant medicine. He's, one of, he's our pediatric transplant social worker, and he'll be sharing the social stress of transplant. Jessica Hoover, a PharmD, and also um, the director of the Pediatric uh, Pharmacy Residency. And she will be talking about understanding your transplant medications. And then lastly, we'll have Dr. Chun Hook David Kwan, who is the director of laparoscopic liver surgery at Cleveland Clinic. And he will be speaking on laparoscopic approach for living liver donors, saving lives with less pain. We will answer questions for all of the panelists at the end of the presentation, so be sure to write your questions down in the chat box as we go along through the presentations. So let's go ahead and get started with Andy. Hello. Kat, I'm requesting, okay. My name is Andy Adler, and as Dr. Hubert said, um, 
I'm going to be discussing nutrition uh, for biliary atresia. Oops. So for pre-transplant nutrition, a dietitian's role is to promote growth. We talk about weight and length. We assess intake to make sure that the nutrition needs are being met to promote growth. We talk about monitoring nutrition labs and monitoring stool and color patterns. In monitoring growth, we look at a growth chart. We talk about changes in weight and length and their weight for length trends, which is a baby BMI. We also use something called the mid upper arm circumference measurement, and it helps better assess lean muscle mass as compared to the rest of the body because it's not affected by fluid status. And we look at a nutrition focused physical exam to assess fat stores and muscle mass absence or wasting. We also talk about intake. Is the baby or the patient taking breast milk if they're an infant? Um, and if they're not, we tend to use high MCT containing formulas such as progestamil. Then we also talk about is the patient having special mixing instructions um, to promote growth, to give extra calories. And we talk about the volume per feed and the number of times a day a patient is fed. We talk about the route. Sometimes a patient needs tube feeds to supplement their oral intake. Tube feeds can be run during the daytime after a bottle feed. It can be run overnight or it can be run as continuous feeds throughout the entire day. The stomach capacity sometimes just gets too full due to the liver size to be able to, for the baby to take the amount that they need. This is a picture of a feeding tube. As you can see, the baby has a feeding tube that goes down the nose, and then um, it shows, it portrays where it goes into the esophagus and then ends up in the stomach. If the patient is age appropriate, we talk about baby foods, and we also talk about vitamin and mineral supplements. The babies tend to need um, special water-soluble version of fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, it would be Aqua Adex or Deca Plus, and they may also need individually dosed vitamin supplements for A, D, and E. We monitor liver function enzymes, the fat soluble vitamins, and assess for anemia. When we talk about stooling, we wanna know the number of times a day a patient stools. We wanna know the color of the stool, if it's gray or clay colored, or is it an orangey red Kool-Aid color in the picture here? And that's usually an uh, indication of the, from the vitamin supplements, the vitamin A that is not needed, and it is completely normal. We tell, I tend to tell the families that it, this is gonna be a normal situation with the vitamin supplements. For post-transplant nutrition, we look at the same thing. We monitor the patient's growth, we assess the intake and the nutrition lab related lab values. Again, we monitor the same nutrition parameters. Again, we talk about the same types of feeds. Is it breast milk? Is it formula containing high MCT oil, which tends to be able to be stopped after one month after transplant. Um, you, once the liver function normalizes, patients can tend to go to a regular infant formula and they probably no longer need to have special mixing instructions and can grow on normal amounts of formula. We again talk about the volume per feed and the number of times a day a patient's fed. And sometimes patients still need a tube feed because they might have an oral aversion. There are programs to work with teams to help uh, and teams to help improve oral intake. We talk about baby food again, if it's age appropriate, the vitamin and mineral supplements, the specialized or individual supplements tend to be continued for one month after transplant until the liver function normalizes. At that point, they could go on to a vitamin D supplement or a general multivitamin, but no longer need specialized vitamins. We monitor labs again, liver function enzymes and the fat soluble vitamin levels we get one month after transplant. Vitamin A and E tend to return to normal levels. However, vitamin D tends to be low after transplant due to interaction with the transplant medications. Stooling patterns are again a discussion point and usually the color returns to normal once the specialized vitamin supplements are discontinued. For pediatric patients who have a Kasai procedure, if the liver function normalizes, the pediatric dietitian may no longer need to follow. However, if the liver function continues to be abnormal or worsens years later, the pediatric dietitian can become involved with the care again. For pediatric patients, the pre and post transplant nutrition is the same 
the dietitian has the same role. The only difference is that the formula would be different. We would still want a high MCT containing formula, but it would be of a uh, pediatric or toddler product such as Pediasure peptide or Peptamin Junior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a great presentation. Uh, reminder to everybody to remember to put your questions about nutrition into the chat box and we'll have them ready to go at the end of the presentations. Now we will um, have Kevin Jacobson present. Thank you, Dr. Huberts. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us for this presentation this evening. Um, I am going to hold my microphone away from my beard, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, if you have any difficulties, just throw something in the chat and I will try to make sure that I monitor that. Uh, so the goals that I have for today is uh, one, just gonna talk about what a transplant social worker does because that can tend to be a little confusing. Um, and then the meat of the presentation is gonna be uh, talking about the various stresses that uh, families uh, encounter throughout the transplant process. And generally a high level uh, kind of look at these things um, tend to break down into two camps, kind of financial and concrete resource stress, and then emotional or relational stress. Um, and then, as we've said, at the end of everything, we'll have some time for questions. All right, uh, there we go. So what would you say you do here? Um, when I first meet with a family, uh, what I, the way I briefly tried to describe what a transplant social worker does, uh, at least my role within the team, is that I handle issues that go into supporting a transplant and ensuring that a transplant has a, a long life outside of the hospital. So anything that goes on outside the four walls of the hospital that could conceivably have an impact on the transplant is something that I discuss with families and uh, try to identify ahead of time any issues and provide supports and solutions before they become a problem. Um, very broad kind of definition of, of what we what we do. Um, the role of, of me within the team, uh, pre-transplant, we have to do a full psychosocial evaluation where we're gonna be looking uh, again at financial resources, insurance, um, community supports, like quality of relationships, any issues with uh, employment, legal history, substance abuse, mental illness, uh, anything that you could think of that could conceivably have an impact on transplant, we generally uh, cover in the pre-transplant evaluation. Um, throughout the hospitalization, I continue to meet with families uh, as needed to provide uh, support, checking in on the status of connecting with community resources where appropriate um, and making, and overall trying to help ensure there's clear communication between the, the family, the parents and the medical team. Uh, and this relationship will evolve and uh, continue throughout their transplant journey uh, until they transition from pediatrics to adult. So next we're gonna kind of talk first about the, the financial and concrete stresses that I typically see with families uh, in transplant. Um, first, transplant is expensive. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not even just talking about the, the cost of hospitalization, surgery, uh, all of those things that come to mind when you think of medical care. Um, the things that people usually consider when thinking about finances is their insurance coverage for the procedure, um, how long they're gonna be in the hospital, which also can mean for parents how long they're gonna be away from work, how long they're gonna be away from any income coming into the house, because we all know bills don't stop at home just because you're in the hospital. Um, cost of surgery, medication follow-up, those are typically what folks think of when they're thinking about the costs of transplant. Um, things that are less commonly considered that uh, often become issues and that we, we try to get ahead of is, uh, again, the loss of income, uh, especially for families who either work uh, kind of traditional day labor jobs or don't have um, paid time off that they're able to take or single parent families that aren't able to, to kind of split split those resources amongst themselves. Um, transportation is, is a big one. Um, gas to and from home and the hospital, uh, just while you're inpatient, but then also after you're discharged from the hospital, you're coming back here a lot 
for follow-up appointments, uh, ultrasounds, biopsies, uh, and that that gas and parking uh, adds up. Um, so having reliable transportation and the ability to maintain a car, uh, fuel it, those sorts of things uh, we talk about. Um, and then, you know, food and lodging, your basic human needs. While you're here, you're going to need to be able to eat. You're going to need a place to stay, um, especially in, the, in our COVID-19 times, um, depending on the, the status of the pandemic. In the Cleveland area, we're able to, you know, have one parent stay overnight, maybe two. Uh, and then also for long term, if folks are waiting for weeks and weeks, um, having more of a long term solution for those things uh, are some of the, the more typical conversations that, that I engage with. Um, some of the resources that we have and that I commonly ask families to look into is first organ uh, specific organizations um, such as the American Liver Foundation. Uh, there's uh, some for heart transplant like our Enduring Hearts program, um, local support organizations. We have one here in Cleveland called Brody's Good Vibe Tribe, uh, which was started by the, the parents of one of our uh, liver transplant recipients does some amazing work with, with families here in the community. Um, these can be sources for both financial support and like concrete resources, resources but then also a great source of information uh, specific to liver disease, liver transplant, um, whatever you're particularly looking for as, as a family. Um, another thing I always encourage families to do, um, especially if they have a strong community support is to fundraise. It's pretty common to have families come in and say that uh, a friend of a friend or you know, a cousin or an in-law started a GoFundMe um, to help with some of the costs of transplant. Um, I love that idea. I love where people's hearts are at doing that. Um, one of the things we have to consider is that for every dollar raised with uh, a GoFundMe or kind of these popular uh, fundraising platforms, Typically, the, the platform itself will take anywhere from, you know, seven to 10 cents out of every dollar raised. So the money that you're raising is not 100% going towards the, the family or the support of the child. Um, and also when it comes time for filing taxes, any money taken from those accounts is counted as income, which for some of our uh, single parent families, people who rely on public assistance or who have Medicaid, that can bump you out of qualifying for those resources. So it could actually put some put families into an area where because of the fundraising, they are no longer able to uh, afford their housing or they're no longer able to get the food stamps and put food on their table. Um, so it's, it's something that is complicated, which is why I always recommend families, if they're gonna do fundraising, do it with an organization called CODA. It's the Children's Organ Transplant Association. When fundraising through them, 100% um, of the money goes to families. Uh, it's tax deductible for the, the donors and it's never counted as income. So it doesn't affect the, any community or uh, public programs that families are already engaged in. Uh, all right. Okay, now we're gonna talk about emotional stress, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so the, the costs of transplant, um, from the emotional side is something that, that you would probably consider it like finding out, uh, either as a patient or uh, a caregiver that a child needs a transplant and needs us to survive is a traumatic experience. It's a life-changing experience. Um, there are much higher rates of, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, higher rates of generalized anxiety, uh, depression, and guilt, both in, in caregivers and uh, also noted in, in patients kind of down the line. Um, again, uh, just kind of going over some of the, the definitions and things you want to look out for uh, with PTSD. Um, one, it's caused by an exposure to trauma and in the role of uh, transplant, you know, death, threat of death or injury, uh, injury being like a cert major surgery uh, is definitely an exposure to, to trauma. Uh, kind of symptoms that, that I see with families are 
when they're first coming back for follow-up appointments, starting to maybe uh, increased work of breathing or uh, like a hypervigilance sort of like fast breath as they're getting closer. Um, children being uh, inconsolable, really uh, kind of on, on high alert, um, not wanting to, to come back to, you know, what for them could be a very scary place. Um, avoiding it, blocking it out, dissociation, those things are all uh, kind of hallmarks and things as a caregiver you would want to look and watch out for for your child, but then also monitor for yourself um, or your, your partner or whoever is kind of that, that immediate inner circle that is dealing with the transplant. Um, then, yeah, coming back to more of the emotional costs, like really the, uh, for the, I would say the first year uh, after transplant, I almost universally see heightened levels of anxiety, um, but appropriately so, um, from, from family members and uh, parents watching the, their children, wondering if that, that first fever is, you know, is it going to be rejection or uh, every trip back to the hospital, are we going to be admitted? There are just all these fears and anxieties that bubble up. Um, and then, you know, guilt associated with, uh, especially with deceased, deceased donor transplant, um, the knowledge that the, the organ that saved their child had to come from uh, somebody else who, who passed away. Uh, so there, there's definitely um, an emotional and mental health side to these things that we always want to, to get people supported through, um, which is probably another, you know, half of what I do. Um, again, guilt uh, associated with being the, the survivor's guilt associated with the deceased donor. Um, and then also guilt from constantly pre uh, replaying um, pre-diagnosis life, seeing if they're like wondering if they missed things, if any of this could have been pre uh, prevented. Um, looking for places to uh, lay that blame for uh, the, the loss of what was um, their normal, because moving forward, there's going to have to be a new normal. Um, they're totally normal and reasonable reactions to this, um, but it's just what we, we do with that that is important. So getting folks connected with counseling, uh, both immediately here in the hospital, just to, for kind of stabilization and to, to support, but then also when appropriate back back home to help start uh, processing some of this, this guilt and grief that, that needs to happen after, after a transplant. And all right. And then again, uh, consistently reinforcing the importance of support. Um, having a community surround the family makes a huge difference uh, for the success of a uh, transplant, um, both just the nuts and bolts, making sure get medications, make it to appointments, uh, but then also, you know, uh, things that, that we've talked about earlier that don't necessarily commonly, you know, get thought of, uh, covering bills at home, meals, uh, lodging, all these sorts of things. Um, and then again, the importance to grieve, establishing a new normal. Um, online, uh, especially in COVID, having uh, online support groups, uh, other parents and individuals that have gone through uh, transplant has been incredibly um, helpful for folks. Again, it's this peer support, someone who's been there before you, someone who uh, gets it uh, for lack of a lack of a better term. Um, yeah, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, thanks, everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, sorry, Dr. Hubert. Sorry, sorry. I was talking, forgot to unmute myself. Uh, great presentation, Kevin. And I think, you know, while all these things can happen after transplant, it's important to remember it's, it's actually natural to feel a lot of these things. And some people feel it more than others. And that's where Kevin and our psychology team are actively involved with uh, patients and families uh, to get through all of this because it's normal to feel all those a lot of those stresses and, and important to acknowledge those. So thank you, Kevin, for talking about that. Now we'll have Jessica Hoover present uh, on understanding your transplant medications. 
Thank you so much for that introduction. Sorry, I interrupted you. Um, first off, thank every thank you to um, everyone for coming. Um, I am, like Dr. Hubert said, the solid organ transplant pharmacist um, for the liver transplant team. And um, if you weren't already familiar with this, medications are one of the most important aspects of your regimen and kind of your life post transplant. Oh, got a little jumpy there. Hold on. There we go. Um, so one of the, um, some of the important things for families, oh, it's like laggy, um, to know is that medications for transplant are going to be lifelong. And it is important to take these medications exactly as prescribed and it is exactly as explained to you um, by either myself, like a pharmacist or your provider. Um, with these medications, there are a lot of drug-drug interactions, so we tell you to always call if you are started on something new by maybe your PCP or another physician, um, because those can interact with some of your transplant medications. And then lastly, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, avoiding risk for infections, which clearly this is a hot button issue right now in the time of coronavirus, um, but some of the tips on how you can avoid um, risks of infections, because that can be very dangerous, um, as long as along with some of the medications you would be on to prevent those. So it can be extremely daunting for families, caregivers, and patients to go from taking maybe one or two medications a day, or even sometimes none, to going to taking several medications that they're going to need to take in order to keep their organ. So we um, at the Cleveland Clinic and lots of other institutions utilize a program called MedAction Plan. This is a medication scheduling tool that we give you and go over before you go home to kind of remind you and help you familiarize yourself with your medications and how much you are getting. So on the screen in front of you is an example of one of these plans. So of course, this would be tailored to each individual patient. But as you can see, it has a list of medications on the left-hand side, along with times across the top. And those can be customized to what would work the best for you um, and your um, environment. And then lastly, you have here um, the amounts that you're giving in both, if it's a pediatric patient, it can be in MLs. Um, along with um, the doses and milligrams. So just a tool that we have um, to kind of help you remember medications and make sure that you are adherent. So there's two big groups of medications that we talk about when we talk about transplant. And the first one is your immunosuppressions or immunosuppressants. So the way that I explain these to our um, patients and caregivers and to kids is that our body is like our own country. And in our, in our own country of our body, we have all of these little army men that are constantly fighting infections and all the, the nasty stuff that we touch every day. But when we get a new organ, our body sees that as an outside invader. So what tools do we have to prevent them from recognizing that new organ as an outside invader? And that really is our immunosuppressant medications. So so these provide a blindfold to uh, for those army men where they are blindfolded and they can't necessarily rec recognize that new organ as an outside invader. So these, of course, are used to prevent your body from rejecting our new organ. So everyone that gets transplanted will be on immunosuppressants. And there's only very, very rare circumstances that a patient would ever be taken off of these. So we consider these lifelong medications and are really the mainstay of therapy to make sure that that organ um, doesn't get rejected or recognized by the body as an outside invader. There are three common immunosuppressants that we use. Of course, there are others that we have to use in different clinical scenarios, but the three most common immunosuppressants that a patient would be on is tacrolimus, which its brand name is Prograf. And we consider that the gold standard of immunosuppressant regimens. The next medication is mycophenolate mofetil, or the brand name is Celsept. And the last one is prednisone or prednisolone, which is a steroid. So your regimen will consist of probably these three medications, at least at the beginning. And then sometimes we'll peel some of them off. Tacrolimus though will be a lifelong medication. The next group of medications that we'll talk about is anti-infective uh, medications. So these are important because as we used our, our previous example about our body being our own country, once we've blindfolded those army men, they can't necessarily recognize some common viruses or bacteria that can be very dangerous to you now that your immune system is lower. So we use a couple of medications to prevent you from getting certain bacterial, fungal, or viral infections. I mean, it's just really to keep you safe. So everyone who gets a new organ will be on these medications to start off. And then we kind of peel some of them away as you get um, a little bit further into your transplant. 
These medications most commonly is sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, very, very long name, I know, um, but this most commonly called Bactrim. This is a medication that prevents um, a certain type of dangerous pneumonia that people who are immunosuppressed can get. The next one is acyclovir um, or Zovirax is its brand name. Um, this one is an antiviral and prevents um, certain viral infections, but most commonly the virus that causes cold sores. Um, and then last is Nystatin. And this one's actually an oral swab that we use inside the mouth to prevent thrush, which if you have ever had an infant or a baby um, is very common in that population, but it's also common um, after you get a transplant. So to summarize, medication regimens consist of immunosuppressant and anti-infective medications. Most of these medications will be lifelong and we have various tools that are available to help you remember the name, the dosage and the frequency of your medications. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. That was a great presentation and a reminder to put all of your questions into the chat a box, so we'll have them ready to go at the end of the presentation uh, with, with regards to medications uh, and also the, the social workers role at this point. So our next presenter is Dr. Kwan, and he'll speak on laparoscopic approach for living donor donors, living, living liver donors. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for the nice introduction and uh, thank you for having me in uh, so that I can share my experience at Cleveland Clinic about <clears throat> the laparoscopic approach for doing surgery for the living donors. Okay, so this is slightly graphic, uh, but I often get the question about uh, patients asking me, uh, the donors to ask me, how does my liver look like? And the recipients also ask me, how did my liver look like? So this is uh, a liver of a donor. You can see the liver is really healthy. Uh, here you see the nice coloration of, uh, you know, uh, brown, pinkish um, color of the liver. And this is a liver of a cirrhotic, uh, you know, that has been uh, cirrhotic and it's not properly functioning. So we're replacing this liver with the previous, with this liver. And that is what a living donor liver transplant is go, goes through. So when you go for a living donor liver transplant, we... There are options to do it for adults and for pediatric as well. In adults, we usually use the right or left lobe, full left lobe, which consists for the right around 60 to 70%, for left about 30 to 40%. In case for pediatric, uh, as you can see in the image here, for pediatric, if you use a big size of a liver, it's a little bit too big. So as you can see here, the small part of the liver that corresponds to about the size of the liver for the for the for the small baby it is the left lateral of the liver and consists of about 20 to 25% of the liver. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially in infants, uh, those babies who are maybe uh, two month old or one month old, they're even smaller. Most of the patient, most of the babies with biliary atresia, they get transplant around uh, 12 months. But sometimes you have uh, little babies that have acute liver failure at two or three months. And in those cases, we do what we call a reduced or hyper-reduced. So we cut those, the left lateral, even you know, smaller pieces uh, and uh, offer it to the, the baby. So uh, if you're thinking about living donor liver transplant in a pediatric case, um, it's most likely they will receive a left lateral if you're a donor. Now, during my early years, when I was learning about how to do a living donor liver transplant, in the early 2000s, Everything about living donor liver transplant about, was about the donor safety. And in order to assure donor safety, it was very important that we had good uh, view, surgical view to do the operation. So usually this is the incision that we used to put in. We call it a Mercedes-Benz incision uh, to have maximal good view for maximal safety operation. Now as time flowed and we gained more experience, we, we started to reduce the incision size and uh, the one that you see in the left upper quadrant, this is what we call a hockey stick or reverse L incision. Uh, the one in the right upper quadrant is what we call a uh, mid, midline upper midline incision. And usually for pediatric, uh, this is the incision that we put in uh, for, uh, to take the left lateral of the, of the liver. Now, we have more experience in order to improve more the quality of the life of the donors. Uh, we are in the period of where a fully laparoscopic living donor 
uh, is an option. Here you can see that through the small holes, uh, you do the whole procedure and through the incision, the fan is still here, that's where the liver comes out. So why laparoscopic? Well, you probably have heard about different other surgeries being done laparoscopic, and it's usually shown to have less pain, uh, earlier recovery, you know, it's a lot easier on the donor. And here it was a just brief comparison of, of, of the donors using a left-sided liver. The, the technique used for laparoscopy is usually a lot more difficult than an open, Therefore, it usually takes a little bit longer. But as you can see here, the blood loss, length of stay, uh, and it's important for living donors who are mostly in their active uh, social life uh, period, uh, you know, going back to work is very important. So the time going back to work is a lot shorter for laparoscopy compared to open. And the graft survival is really not that different between uh, donors who gave the liver by open method or by laparoscopy. This is another comparative study comparing kidney donors and left-sided hepatectomy. Uh, laparoscopic approach for kidney donors is something as uh, we call it the standard way of doing. So most living donors donating their kidney, they are receiving by laparoscopic. Um, so this is a comparison of kidney donors compared to left side uh, liver. And you can see the complication on the liver side is less than uh, the kidney, uh, both in minor and major uh, complication. So why isn't there that many centers doing laparoscopic approach? Uh, the one important uh, reason is because of the technical complexity of the operation. It is a very, very technically challenging operation. It's very difficult to do it. So going through the learning curve on how to do it well and afford the safety to the donors has been very difficult to achieve for many centers. Here are these, uh, uh, you know, a uh, graph illustrating the numbers of liver resection done laparoscopically. Uh, you can see in, uh, in green line, the percentage of uh, cases done laparoscopic com compared uh, uh, in comparison to the total volume of liver resection. This is for cancers and not for living donors. We can see barely 6% of all donors, uh, sorry, of all cancer patients are receiving laparoscopically instead of open. So. You can see even in cancer operations where it is, it is relatively easier to do than living donors, only 6% uh, receive it laparoscopically. I think by, by now, pro uh, probably close to 10%, but we are still there uh, trying to understand how to do it easier and safer. Uh, at Cleveland Clinic, after I joined here, I joined here two years ago. Uh, the first thing I did was have a very good uh, support of uh, a lot of fancy medical instruments that are very, very important for the safety of the donor operation. Here you can see, we use the 3D screen, a 3D scope, which is we put on 3D glasses to do operation. And so we can, we can have a much better view inside the OR and do it much more refined liver surgery as compared to 2D. And there are some other, these fancy names are some other very important instruments that are actually very, very helpful to make the whole surgery very, very safe. And as on the right side, you can see uh, they will always, in every donors, we do a 3D vascular and biliary reconstruction so as to see the exact anatomy of where we're going through in order to make the surgery safer. Um, again, as a, after, right after I joined here in 2008, end of 2018, the first thing was to improve the quality of laparoscopic surgery for our all laparoscopic liver resection cases. So the numbers of laparoscopic cases have gone quite a bit up a lot. And this is a brief um, video of, from the picture from outside. Inside, I, I purposely not uh, put in so that because maybe a little bit too graphic. Uh, so this is you know how we put in the ports in there. And you can see from the umbilicals, uh, this is where the camera goes through. So we go through the camera, watch how things are inside through a video. And this is how I operate throughout the op, you know, throughout the whole procedure. This is how I operate, you know, take those, put, put in those complicated instruments in, do the procedure, take it out. Um, so it's a very relatively very difficult operation to do because I'm constrained of the motions. And this is the incision that we put uh, right above uh, the pivot line. 
uh, we call this a fantasy incision. This is the same incision that, uh, uh, that the mothers get when they have a cesarean section to deliver babies through a C-sac. And we put a uh, plastic bag through in there. And uh, once the liver is um, completely cut and removed, we take the, the graft out through that incision, just as if, as if a baby would be delivered, okay? So to make it a little bit easier to understand, uh, unfortunately, the, the voice is not out there. Hmm. So this is the case uh, for, for our first uh, laparoscopic living donor. It is a very nice gentleman who wanted to save his uh, uh, girlfriend's father uh, from, uh, from, from liver cirrhosis. Uh, so we, you know, he was our first case, but uh, everything ended up really nice. This is him uh, lying there with his girlfriend. Uh, I've been talking a little bit about uh, the, the benefit of it, but I'll just skip this part since you can't see much. Um, after the launch of the program in 2019, uh, fortunately, the program did quite well. And as of November of last year, actually, all the donors at our clinic are done laparoscopic. Uh, so actually, open living donors are not done uh, anymore. But of course, the open cases will be reserved there for in cases for really, really um, difficult cases to be done laparoscopically. I'll do it open. Uh, again, uh, said that uh, in living donor liver transplant, the donor safety is uh, the most important aspect that we always look at. And if you look at the data that we have until now concerning uh, the result of laparoscopic, uh, here, here you can see a result of a laparoscopic versus open. Uh, this is the open that we did before. And uh, oh, sorry. Uh, here you can see that the uh, operative time actually, because of uh, we, we set it up really nicely, um, the time didn't take that long. It was almost the same as in, in laparoscopic as in open. The estimated blood loss, which is EDL, uh, this is actually lower in laparoscopic. The overall complication, you can see here that in open era, well, we had about 43% of complication as compared to 4.2% in laparoscopic. And the length of stay was also reduced. Uh, here, looking at just the complication, in laparoscopy, we had just a single uh, brief uh, in infection of, this, uh, of the skin, whereas in the open, we had a long list of different kinds of complications that can happen in donors. So again, uh, when things are well set up and things are done properly, uh, I think uh, laparoscopy can afford actually very, very safe and uh, good outcome for all donors. This is a brief illustration again of uh, you know, the procedures that we do. We put in the ports and through the ports, we do the, the, the transection of the liver. Initially, all patients undergo a cholecystectomy. So we divide uh, the cystic duct and the cystic artery. And after we split, uh, this is a new technique called the ICG cholangiogram in which we give the patient some, uh, a dye called ICG and that uh, is being excreted through the biliary tree. And we have a special camera that becomes fluorescent so we can see the biliary tree so we can divide it at the exact point. So again, we put that there in the bag and after we divide all the vessels, the liver is taken out through the fantasy incision. Okay, so uh, you know, living donor liver transplant is a good option for uh, end-stage liver disease, both for adult and pediatric. Uh, laparoscopy hepatectomy is gaining a little bit wider acceptance, but still we are very low. Um, the peroptic outcome is comparable to open or even better. Uh, and uh, even though I would say it's still in the development stage, 
um, more and more centers around the world are performing this um, surgery. And, and uh, for pediatric cases, uh, it is comparable to uh, a standard procedure called laparoscopic kidney donors. And the recent data from our Cleveland Clinic uh, are quite promising with a very low rate of complication. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. That was a wonderful talk. Um, now, and we'll, again, I, re I remind everyone, please put your questions into the chat room. I know Dr. Leonis and I have thrown a few in there, but please go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. DeBroy will go ahead and ask questions to the panel from the chat box, but as she's doing it, if you've thought of something, don't be shy, put the questions in there. So thank you, Vera. Um, I'll go through the questions in the sequence that they came in. The first question is directed to Kevin. Um, Emily Onis is asking, what percentage of patients are able to get their transplant cost needs met by insurance or Medicaid? What percentage do you think have unmet debts as a consequence of transplant related costs? That is a very good question. Um, here at the Cleveland Clinic, probably about, I would venture to say roughly 50% of our patient population is on uh, Medicaid. In that case, 100% uh, of the, the cost is gonna be covered by the insurance. The, that includes the hospital stay, the surgery, follow-up appointments, medications, that is gonna get covered. Um, when you're dealing with commercial insurances, that, that changes. And it can change uh, quite a bit depending on the insurance. Um, the other 50% of our patients will all, uh, the year of their surgery, hit their deductible. I mean, having the cost of a transplant is in the hundreds of thousands close or over a million dollars. Um, so you will definitely hit that deductible. Um, I've seen deductibles range anywhere from $5,000 up to, you know, 10, 15. Um, and then, then it becomes kind of a case by case basis. Uh, some of our families are able to meet that expense without assistance and are able to, once they hit their deductible, they write a check, get it paid. And then the rest of the year, insurance covers everything. Um, this is another reason why I really recommend uh, our families to do fundraising and to tap into the relationships and the communities that they have, uh, because that bank of money is something that can be used for these insurance co-pays, um, both for the hospitalization and then also years to come for, for medications, for appointments, um, all these things that are gonna be associated with taking care of the liver. Um, and another thing I always recommend, especially if uh, both parents are employed um, and doing fundraising is to approach your employer, see if they do uh, like a um, charitable giving match. Uh, Cause that again is a tax deductible thing that businesses can use to, to help write off at the end of the year, but it can be a source of um, a really good source of income to, to help meet some of these expenses. Thank okay. you very much, Question. Kevin. <laughs> Um, for Andy, why do patients with jaundice need fat-soluble vitamins? That was so a question when, from Dr. Hubert. When patients have jaundice, they have a malabsorption, specifically fat malabsorption. And these specific vitamins are your fat-soluble vitamins. So they tend to be malabsorbed. So we have to give them a certain type of product that can be absorbed with their current clinical condition. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Kwan, this question is for you from M. Leonis. Fascinating to hear your talk. Why is there such a reduction in blood loss for the laparoscopic approach versus open? Is it just from decreased blood loss from the smaller length of incisions? No, the length of incision actually doesn't have much blood loss. We have very good blood control while we make the incision. Most of the blood loss reduction actually um, comes from the interperitoneal carbon dioxide that we put in during laparoscopic surgery, but that is at the risk of, uh, you know, you, you have to do it properly because the liver has a lot of vessels inside. So if you look at the early data of laparoscopic liver resection, actually you have more bleeding uh, when you do laparoscopically because you're, you do it less well as compared to open because of this restriction of motions. But as uh, surgeons gain conf, you know, experience and they learn how to control bleeding better, uh, actually, you know, it came to a degree where the advantage of uh, having intraperitoneal 
um, carbon dioxide pressure, positive pressure, that you that that acts like a pneumo, pneumo tamponade that reduces a lot of the bleeding from the cut surface of the liver. And that's why most of the recent data, they have less bleeding um, uh, loss. The early data is actually they have more because it's a lot more difficult to, to do it laparoscopically compared to open. Um, the next question is also to you, Dr. Kwan. It's coming from Dr. Huberts. Are living donors better than cadaveric donors? Well, this is a very tricky question, but I'm glad that you brought this up because this is also a question that I get asked a lot of times. When you just look at the operative result itself, there is really not that much difference. Uh, if you look at overall, the laparoscopic uh, living donor tend to have a slightly higher complication rate of, compared to a deceased donor. But if you look at the whole picture of the survival of the recipient, uh, laparoscopic, uh, uh, sorry, the living donor fares better than a uh, deceased donor. Uh, the main reason is because in living donor, you can plan for the surgery. Uh, if you expect the patient will get sicker, let's say in the next six months, we don't have to wait until six months until you know the patient gets sick enough to go up the ladder of the MEL score to get a, a organ and be transplanted when the patient is really sick. You can do it six months ahead if you have a donor. And therefore, uh, you know, the degree of sickness the patients are usually undergoing living donor liver transplant is less, therefore you have a better chance of survival post-op. And also, you know, sometimes you have uh, things that happen while you're on the waiting list, you know, and that patients cannot recover from. And that's why you, that's why you have a waiting list mortality and all of that is, you don't have that in living donor liver transplant because you can plan ahead, you can do it, you know, ahead before the patients get too sick. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. We'll get back to you in just a few minutes. I think there are other folks who have some questions. This next question is from Kat Evans to Kevin. Surgery can be terrifying for anyone. How do I initiate the conversation with my child about getting a transplant? I think that's a great question. Yeah, um, it is a great question. Um, Depending on the age of the child, uh, you're going to take a few different approaches. Um, one thing that I always recommend uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic is to get involved with our uh, child life team. Um, they have a number of age uh, specific resources um, to talk about scary medical procedures um, and surgery would definitely qualify about, uh, for that. Then also to do some guided medical play. Um, getting them used to some of the things they're going to start to see in, in the hospital they're able to do. Um, I, I have a couple of resources, uh, books talking about transplant, um, like kind of more child appropriate, I'd say age range of like three to six, seven years old um, that start ba very basically talking about, you know, being sick, going and getting better. Um, but what I, what I would recommend for, for parents is, you know your children the best. Um, so have an early conversation to the extent that you feel comfortable about um, the process of getting sick and getting better. Just kind of that overall overarching thought, being sick to well and, and what that looks like. Um, and then the, the hospital team and the child life team can help kind of fill in the, the specifics and the supports you need to get that message uh, across in a way that will be received um, and in a way that is uh, as you know, child-friendly and unthreatening as possible. Thank you, Kevin. The next question is directed to Jessica from Kat Evans. What are my child's restrictions while on immunosuppressants? So that's a great question and um, something I get asked a lot. Um, what I always tell parents um, and caregivers and patients is that our goal with the liver transplant or any transplant is for you to be as normal as possible. So um, that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a couple of restrictions that we have to keep in mind, but our goal is for them to be able to play, to eat, to go to school and everything as normal as possible. So the biggest ones um, that we counsel patients um, on is of course the risk of infection. So we talk about that and kind of ways to, to mitigate that, you know, of course, not being around someone who's sick, um, washing hands, all things that we have learned in the, in the time of COVID and are becoming very second nature. Um, 
And then um, there are some foods that we um, avoid. Luckily, I have Andy who um, also helps me counsel a lot of our patients about just some of the foods um, and different ways we may have to prep food to kind of keep the risk of infection. And then some medic um, foods that can, of course, interfere with our medication. So like grapefruit juice, pomegranate juice, things like that. Um, and then the last thing is really just drug-drug interaction. So that means you can't just go to your you know, neighborhood pharmacy, your Meyer pharmacy, your CVS pharmacy, um, and pick up you know any over-the-counter herbal or cold remedy. Um, and so that just really kind of requires a little bit of for, um, foresight to be able to call us and make sure they don't interact. But other than that, sports, things like that, um, you know, of course, far enough out of surgery, um, they can leave, lead a normal life. Thank you, Jessica. I'll, I'll jump in as well. We used to be really strict about our kids um, post-transplant not eating any berries. And I used to tell my, the kids' parents, that I didn't want them to be eating any fruit they couldn't peel. One parent then said, well, can my child eat grapes? I said, well, if you want to peel each grape, please go ahead and feed the child grapes. But I think that's, that's kind of extending to what Jessica is saying is we're really trying to be very careful to avoid any, any infections. And this is why when the child, especially early on after transplant is on a lot of immunosuppression, these doses go down over time. Um, we really do want to be quite careful about things that we wouldn't have normally thought about pre-transplant, things like salads, things like you know fresh fruit, all of those things um, have to be um, put into perspective. Sushi, we're, we're not thrilled about things like that. Um, our next question is to Dr. Kwan from Kat Evans. Dr. Kwan, how do you choose the next donor liver for my child? And is there a benefit to receiving a living donor liver versus a deceased donor liver? I think you sort of answered that before, yeah. but I'll let you go mm -hmm. ahead and, and Well, I guess, that. I mean, it, it goes uh, from this, uh, again, from, to the same uh, answer that in living donor liver transplant, you can sort of like schedule around, uh, you know, like in deceased donor, you get a call one day mm -hmm. and then you have to rush to the hospital to get it. So you are always at a standby Whereas a living donor, you can, uh, you know, schedule the whole thing, uh, the, the schedule for the donors, schedule for the recipient. And then when it's the right time for you to go for the procedure, then we can go. And, you know, again, you can, you can get the transplant before the patient gets too sick. It is one of the reasons why, despite the higher complication rate in living donor compared to deceased donor, uh, the reason why the survival overall is better in living donor liver transplant is because you don't have that dropout rate uh, while you're in the waiting list. One more question for you, Dr. Kwan, uh, coming from Suzanne. What is the age range for a living donor? I have a potential donor who just turned 60 and is very healthy, however, has traveled to Honduras within the last three years. Would this preclude this person as a living liver donor? Uh, the age limit for, for donors is different from institutions. Some institutions who are very conserv conservative, they have a 55. Uh, I know an institution that is very relaxed and they, they put an upper limit, upper cap at 70. So, you know, it depends on the institutions, but overall the, the consensus is uh, between 60 to 65 is usually the cutoff line. If the patient, and it's also always by case by case. So in case uh, the patient is 60 years old, it's really healthy. Uh, I mean, we could consider him or her as, uh, as a potential donor. The history of having gone to Honduras and, uh, within the last three years isn't really that big of an issue. Uh, the only thing is that we have to verify whether, because Honduras is in a tropical region, we just have to you know, verify from our infection team whether the patient has an ongoing uh, uh, infectious disease. If not, I mean, there's no reason why we, we, we should not consider that, that person for a living donor. Uh, and more than you know, the age, uh, most of the times that, that we decline that person for being a living donor is the donor's health overall. Uh, some patients are obese with BMI of 35. Uh, we usually can't accept those patients. We had the normal uh, BMI of the donors at our institutions is around 28. So 28 to 30 is around the, uh, you know, the, the, the BMI that most donors are because the risk of the donors, again, um, you know, the living donor liver transplant can only be done, you know, with the solid foundation that the donors will be safe after the operation. And patients who have, tend to have a higher BMI, they tend to have fatty livers, 
they tend to be, be hypertensive, they tend to have diabetes and a lot of other diseases. So, and you don't want to jeopardize the, the, you know, the safety, the health of the donor just to go for living donor liver transplant. How long would a person who just had a child have to wait to be a living liver donor? Uh, usually uh, having a child or having any kind of major surgery, uh, we usually give the, uh, the, you know, the, the patients one year to recover. Uh, it's not usually, you know, you know, let's say emergency situation, we could make it shorter, but usually it takes time about a little bit more than six months for the body to fully recover. And again, going for the safety of the donor purpose, we, we, we roughly have a line of one, one, one year. We have actually Cleveland Clinic has the highest rate of uh, donation, uh, highest numbers of patients who donate a liver after donating a kidney. And we also have the same uh, criteria of that they have to wait at least one, one year until they fully recover. They were, they were really sure that the patient is, has completely recovered from the uh, initial uh, surgery or big medical event, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to proceed forward. Teresa Davidson is asking uh, Dr. Kwan, how much has COVID-19 affected living donor transplants? Uh, well, this also depends on institutions, but overall looking at the whole United States, numbers of living donors have gone down. Uh, the main reason is because of the fear of the ICU. Uh, and the second, uh, the fear of COVID infection to the donors. So if you look at the data that came from the early period of, uh, from China, uh, where they weren't apparent, they didn't know that there was COVID-19 and they underwent major surgery, the survival rate is really, really low. I mean, I mean the mortality rate is high, meaning it's not like 50%, it's 5% to 10%. And in a situation where we have a living donor, uh, you know, even 1% cannot be accepted. So uh, many institutions are like when the COVID-19 hit, were like for the safety of the donor, let's them, uh, let, let us have a pause on the living donor program. Some institutions didn't pause and they, they kept on going. And from what I hear, they, they didn't have any issues on, 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 um, with, the, you know, with the program. But those are the two main concerns. Uh, as for Cleveland Clinic, we paused for about two months and then we restarted the program. We have a lot of uh, stringent policies uh, considering COVID-19. Uh, just one brief example, we do two COVID-19 checks on all donors. We do one, uh, most living donors are done on Monday. We do one on Thursday and we do one final check on Sunday, just to be sure that the patient uh, is not like false negative. Uh, and you know, that's why we double check. Uh, we actually had one pick case that we detected was negative on Thursday and turned out to be positive on Sunday. So we had to cancel the case. So uh, let's say overall, you know, began, it is the third highest day for deaths since the pandemic. And there are 585 new hospitalizations, pushing the total to over 27. Okay, uh, that, was, that wasn't me. <laughs> Ah, um, thank you again, Dr. Kwan. Um, I would say from university hospital standpoint as well, I think we have taken extra care with our living donor program too, because the goal here is to protect the living donors. We recognize that the recipients need organs, but the overarching goal is to make sure that our donors are safe. So we too have instituted as part of our living donor program, a two COVID test policy. We do our first COVID test at seven days before the planned operation and the next one within 72 hours of the planned operation. Yes. Again, with the goal of um, if there's any questions, if there's an indeterminate result, if there's any symptoms um, to delaying uh, or deferring the operation. The, as Dr. Kwan mentioned, the data that we have is mostly from China and from Europe. We um, have not had uh, fortunately any living donor issues in this country, but that was different across the, uh, across the country based on the impact of COVID. What you saw coming out of New York, New York had to completely shut down. 
elective surgeries in Ohio were put on hold. And we're hearing with this new surge, the third surge that we're seeing, that we may be heading to that situation again, where elective surgeries will be deferred or canceled. So I think it'll be important for everyone thinking about these things to understand that, yes, we can go ahead and plan. And this is what we're telling our donors as well. We can go ahead and plan. But if things, if, if elective surgery shut down, then that will be, um, that, that living donors will be included in that. Cody Reynolds has another, has a question for the group, um, which says our infectious disease team for transplants in Houston has not recommended that our 15 month old get the COVID vaccine yet due to lack of testing. Is that close to the same consensus with other centers? So this is Jessica. Um, I am very fortunate to be sitting right next to the COVID vaccine coordinator for Ohio. Um, and so she just told me that it is not recommended, um, it's not recommended to any pediatric patient because it's not been studied. Um, and so it's going to be um, relying on the next phases of phase three, Katie? phase three studies um, before it'll be approved in pediatric patients less than 12. So it'll probably be probably several years before that um, the results of those studies are performed. And I would just add up, that's why the herd immunity is so important and for adults to get this vaccine when it's available. Thanks, Jessica. I was going to say the same thing. Our infectious disease expert, Dr. Amy Edwards, has been on the Ohio State um, Council discussing this. She says the same thing to us, that it is not recommended. She's actually going so far as to go to 18, um, but she's saying none of the pediatric patients right now should get the uh, COVID vaccine. It just hasn't been tested in children yet. Um, Suzanne has a question. Um, she says, I'm on the list for both the liver and kidney transplant due to PLD, PKD. Would you know the time frame for surgery between receiving the liver and receiving a kidney, both from living donors? Uh, I guess uh, I'll, I'll sort of like uh, take a lead into answering this question. Uh, the first, you know, we first have to see whether the liver is the main issue or the kidney is the main issue. Uh, if the liver is very severe, usually the liver is life-threatening uh, situation. So we will have to plan for liver surgery first and then have the patient in hemodialysis during the recovery and then take the patient back to kidney transplant later on. Usually in the clinical scenario that we see is because the kidney usually fails uh, the earlier stage compared to the liver, uh, a lot of patients that we see for uh, living donor liver transplant for polycystic uh, disease, they, they are already patients that got kidney transplant before. So they had kidney transplant uh, a couple of years later, uh, the liver you know, grew in a size that was not sustainable and we planned for uh, living donor liver transplant later, later on. So the situation of uh, having both of them together and trying to plan for it uh, is not something that we see that, uh, that often, but I would say in case uh, this is, yeah, yeah, I had kidney transplant 18 years ago. So in this situation, uh, you can, we can plan for living donor liver transplant any time. And that's been a, my experience as well from a medical standpoint and taking care of lots of kids with polycystic kidney disease. Sometimes we've transplanted the liver depending on what's happening with the liver first and then the kidneys later um, or the kidneys first and then we follow the liver progress very carefully and then decide if and when the liver needs to be transplanted due to complications. So I think maybe we should move on. I have the uh, great honor to introduce you to two young women that I've taken care of and been um, had the pleasure of working with and watching grow uh, through their lives. Both have had liver transplants. Um, Octavia Giles is a young lady who received her transplant as an infant and for biliary atresia. And Christine Tabar, uh, had a liver transplant as a teenager um, for biliary atresia as well. And I thought they would be great to hear from because their experiences are different. Uh, so I'd ask them to talk a little bit about their journey. So we'll go ahead and start with Octavia um, talking about you know her experiences with the liver transplant uh, and how it all came about. All right. And what she remembers. 
<laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hubert. All right, as you mentioned, my name is Octavia Giles. I'm a recent um, Cleveland State alumna. So I had my transplant at six months. I'm 23, so I had my transplant. For 23 years, I can't really speak to the after effect of the surgery, but I can speak to the process and the procedures and how I felt growing up having to deal with being a liver transplant. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. I have a question, Octavia. So sometimes as children grow up, um, they have problems with, you know, taking their medicines. Maybe they don't want to take their medicines or they forget or how have you dealt with that? Or did you get ang find it, you got angry? Like Dr. Uh, Kevin talked about people getting angry or anxious or so forth. Did you feel any of those things? Yes. So I remember my mom used to have to argue with me to take my medicine when I was little because I didn't understand the extent of having a transplant, um, but I knew that it was like my mom was the stricter parent and my dad was the kind of the parent that stepped in and kind of explained it in a nicer way than she would. And I would, um, you know, just have to realize that I had to take my medicine because I remember being five and uh, not wanting to do anything, didn't want to do the biopsies, didn't want to do like like I, like you said, take my medicine or any of those things, just because I didn't understand what was happening. Was there ever an aha moment where you said, like, okay, I get it. I need to take my medicines. I know you're 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 very compliant now. So, was there a day you sort of woke up and it happened, or? Um, no. It just became second nature. Like just wake up, do it, going about your day. Because I know like from my experience in, my, in living 23 years, speaking to different people and seeing all the things that they have to go through, I'm glad I could just take medicine every 12 hours and going about my day and live my life. And I'm not in a hospital bed. So that's my kind of aha moment. Uh -huh. I'm going to uh, ask Christine to turn on her camera. I'm looking for her. Octavia, can I ask you a question in the meantime? It's it's just the pharmacist kind of compounding on what Dr. Hubert said. You know, it becomes very second nature. Do you have any tips or tricks on how you remember to take medications? Like, do you use an alarm on your phone, a pill box, anything like that? Um, When I was little, it was definitely the pill box because I had the liquid. I had to take the liquids for a long time. My mom used to have to crush up the pills, like I said, because I didn't know how to swallow the pills when I were little. But now as I got older, um, I did the alarm method. But now I don't do the alarm method. My body just literally wakes up at the same time and I take my medicine. And then I have like people that keep me accountable. Like when I'm out with friends, they're like, did you take your medicine? And I'm like, yeah, so I'm very grateful for them. But it just, like I said, becomes second nature. Octavia, I have a question for you as well. Yeah. Um, when you were going to your teens, was there any, you know, like, you know, teens tend to be more rebellious and uh, it's well known that compliance drops when you go into your teens. Mm -hmm. uh, how was it for you? Um, During my teenage years, uh, I just know, like I said, I did not want to be in a hospital bed. Um, I remember during the, when I was a teenager, I caught the chicken box and I had to stay in the hospital for a week and that was not fun. So I never really had an issue taking my medicine during my teenage years. It was mostly, I think for me, um, personally, it was just more of finding myself during my teenage years, not so much of the transplant. I did, I just got to notice that Christine had a power outage, which we've been having blackouts here intermittently. So uh, she hasn't been able to join. I, I think, you know, Christine's, uh, history a journey is a little bit different from Octavia's because Christine presented as a 16 year old who had biliary atresia as well and had the Kasai operation um but I remember when she presented and and I know she wouldn't have any problems with me sharing this one of the things she said to me she said I feel like an old lady because I can't even walk up half of a hill without stopping to breathe she got so tired because of her liver disease and so forth so it, when she underwent her liver transplant, she she really felt so different afterwards. Whereas I think, you know, Octavia, you 
you know, that happened way before you really remembered things, right? You know, and so you didn't have that, oh my gosh, this this made me feel different type of thing, you know. So one of the things I, you touched on it a little bit about, you know, friends even reminding you, how do you tell your friends, you know, about this? Do you, were you ever afraid to talk to them about, you know, having a transplant or you, them seeing your scar? Um, not really. Um, I'm a person, I'm very cautious with people. So I feel people out before I disclose. Um, that I'm a transplant patient. I know for a long time, my mom didn't really want to disclose to people that I was a transplant patient. So, you know, it was the feel sorry for you type of thing. So growing up, I really didn't disclose that I was a transplant patient. Um, but my close friends, they definitely know, but they've been friends for like since I was five. So it was just natural. Some of them even came to the liver walks with me. Um, then only really only disclose um, when it's necessary. And my scars, they're kind of, you can't really see them that much anymore. So if I wear like a bathing suit, you can't really tell that it's kind of a scar there, so. I can vouch for that. <laughs> they look beautiful. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions for Octavia? No, I guess now we'll go back to um, Teresa and for some more Zoomy giveaways. That's right, we're gonna do Zoomy giveaways. So I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Bear with me for a moment. Uh oh. Okay, and start from the current. All your Teresa, I just wanna say thank you so much, Octavia. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for being the best doctor ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank and you. I did not pay you that. <laughs> well, Zoomy giveaways. I've already kind of done the drawings and figured out who's getting the Zoomy giveaways. Uh, we're going to give away two, three now, and then we'll give away two more um, after we do a little bit more. There's just a little bit more to, to presentation. Um, I've got a Liver Life Walk t shirt for Cheryl. Heffrens and a Liver Life Walk t-shirt for Cody Reynolds and then Kate Jensen's getting a Target gift card. So we'll go on to the next thing um, which is to thank our sponsors again, uh, yeah. RX Meyer uh, Specialty Pharmacy and uh, Pharma and I think we have Kevin Morgan representing Miser and he wanted to say a few words to you guys. So Kevin I was going to let you talk. All right, thank you very much, Teresa. Well, it's it's been a, a, a great event and I, I'm glad I've, I've been able to be a part of it. Some excellent speakers and hearing from Octavia, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm with Meyer Specialty Pharmacy, which is Meyer the grocery store. If you live in the Cleveland area, you've probably seen them pop up all over the place right now. And there's actually more on the way. If you haven't been able to stop in, you should check it out. Um, but Meyer has been around since 1934. Um, and we're just expanding out that way right now. And it's a family owned company. They're a private company. And uh, we've always done things to be a part of the community and, and to work with uh, the community. So you'll see that just by going into stores, but also with Meyer Specialty Pharmacy. So our main goal is to work with your doctor's office and your insurance through the prior authorization process to ensure that you can get the specialty medications you need. One thing a lot of people don't realize uh, with Meyer Specialty Pharmacy is that we also have a nursing staff that contacts the, your, the patient or contacts you every single month to just answer any questions you have about your medications and also make, keep up after your insurance to make sure that you can get those medications. Uh, we, also, uh, we also offer, which is unique, we offer uh, home delivery, which is, is pretty standard, but you can also pick up your meds right from a Meyer store if that's convenient for you. Um, but yeah, so just keep us in mind. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really great option. And if you haven't been into one of the stores in Cleveland, definitely stop in because they're beautiful stores. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you. And now um, I, we want to see a, we're going to watch a video here in just a second. Uh, pharma represents the country's leading biopharma pharmaceutical research companies and supports the search for new treatments and cures. Policies that are a priority of pharma include those that help patients access to medicines that they need. They have a medicine assistant tool 
and it's a search engine designed to help patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers learn more about the resources available through the various biopharmaceutical industry programs. So I just have a short video that we're gonna watch. Um, it's not more than a minute, so hold on folks. Our healthcare system can be confusing, especially when it comes to prescription medicines. That's amplified by the fact that many Americans struggle to afford brand name medications. That's where the Medicine Assistance Tool, or MAT, can help. MAT is an online tool designed to help patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers with the information they need to make more educated healthcare decisions. MAT.org provides resources to help patients navigate insurance, as well as financial support programs for patients that lack insurance or have inadequate coverage. MAT is easy to use and takes just three steps. Enter the brand name medicines you'd like more information for. Enter a few demographic details like age, income, and insurance coverage. Then hit continue, and Matt will give you detailed information on cost and coverage. There are a lot of resources available to help patients access their medicines. Matt makes it easier to find the best fit for you. Visit matt.org today. Okay, um, we still have some more Zoomy giveaways. I have two that I'm gonna announce. Uh, the Flavors Cutting Board is going to Robin Hill. And the $100 gift card for Legacy Village, which you can shop, eat, play, or stay at, goes to Suzanne Ahami. Um, I hope that you guys have emails on when you signed up for it so that I can make sure that I get your address and I will be mailing all of that stuff out this week. But due to Christmas being around the corner, just don't expect it in the next couple of days, okay? Um, we want to thank... Uh, Dr. Deb Roy with University Hospitals Transplant Program and Dr. Hoopertz with Cleveland Clinic Children's uh, for all the hard work they did on this event. We also want to thank all the speakers, Andrea Adler, Kevin Jacobson, Jessica Hoover, uh, Dr. Kwan, uh, Octavia Giles, and uh, even though Christine didn't make it, I, I thank her for her effort. Um, please check out the hospital transplant sites and engage with us on Facebook and YouTube. Um, the Ask the Experts program has been recorded and we'll be sending you an evaluation form along with a link for the YouTube video that will be up tomorrow afternoon. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to call and please complete the evaluation. That just will help us know what we need to do next time better. Um, the way I like to end it, um, I want to leave you with a quote from Sonia Johnson and it's one of my favorites. It's, we must remember that one determined person can make a significant difference and that a small group of determined people can change the course of history. In dealing with transplant, you're fortunate to have a couple of teams that you deal with on a daily basis. You have your personal team of family and friends that support you, and you have your transplant team that work with you to help you through the process. I love this quote as I think it really zooms in on the importance of team efforts. Make sure you work with your team to make your experience brighter. Thanks again for for attending today. Remember to complete the survey and have a wonderful holiday se season during December. Thank you all. That's the end of the, the slides. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so Thanks much, Teresa. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. This was a wonderful Thanks, event. Thank you.